This is a production of Cornell University. I'm going to start. Um, so my name is Marion Zuflay. I'm with the New York State IPM program. I work with vegetables, including hemp. Um, the last two years, I've been doing a pest survey in hemp, both insects as well as diseases. Um, and we're going to present some of the main insect pests that we have found. Um, and then Heather's going to introduce herself. And then we're going to kind of tag team this. So we'll, we're going to pass the mic back and forth. Thanks, Mary. And as Chris said, I'm Heather Grab. I'm in the School of Integrative Plant Sciences. Marion's sampling work has focused a lot. I'm sure many, many of your farms she's been out to visit for cannabinoid sampling. A lot of my sampling has focused more on the industrial side of hemp, so thinking more about the grain and fiber market classes. We do have also a handout today. We're going to walk through some of these pests and the kinds of damage that we're seeing with those. I would encourage you to migrate over to the table. We have a QR code posted there that you can scan that will take you directly to this sheet, but we are also going to shorten up our talk a little bit today, so we'll only speak for about 10 minutes before we pass it over to uh, Judson Reed, who's going to talk a little bit about soils and high tunnels, and then we'll have an opportunity, as we love to do with these field days, for you to get out and walk through the plants, and we will work with you uh, to help identify some of these pest and disease issues that we are seeing in the high tunnel here, as well as over in the grow dome today. So relative to what we've heard about already today in terms of weeds and diseases, there's pretty good news on the entomological front. So we see a wide diversity of different insects showing up in hemp, but for the most part, they're all of relatively low concern. Many of these are insect pests that we're familiar with in other cropping systems, which is important to think about when we're managing diverse farms or thinking about crops that are grown after or adjacent to hemp sites. So a lot of the pests that we're gonna think about today here are ones that you would be familiar with from other crops like tarnished plant bugs or Japanese beetles. Many pests of corn are also showing up in hemp very regularly. However, we don't tend to see very high levels of damage. Another really important consideration as the other talks highlighted today is that there are very few products that are registered as treatment options for pests. That's not you know, unique, that's the case with weeds also. So of course, scouting and preventative management with biologicals is very important. We see big differences in pest pressure across different market classes. So hemp that is grown for grain and fiber versus hemp that's grown for cannabinoids and especially in different growing environments, some of which you'll see today between our field trials that we'll visit later this afternoon, um, the high tunnels here, and then in the grow dome, you'll see different levels of pest pressure, which are often higher in protected culture environments like greenhouses where environmental conditions can be more optimal for rapid growth of pests like aphids, spider mites, and thrips. And Justin will talk a little bit more at his talk this afternoon about some biological control strategies that you might think about for those pests. So I'm gonna start off with talking about just a few of the pests that are on the, oh, actually, sorry. We're gonna talk first really briefly about scouting. So I'm gonna pass it over to Marion to key you in on some best practices for scouting in your crops. I just hit something, hopefully it's still on. Um, so I wanted to briefly talk about scouting. When, if you're out there looking at your hemp, ideally you're gonna go out there at least once a week. Um, when you're out there doing other things in your hemp, you're out there anyway. But what we do is usually go out and scout weekly and you wanna go through all your fields, all your different plantings, looking for any insect or disease pest. Um, you wanna look at the plants, select 10 random spots, that's usually our recommendation. Look at the entire plant, look at the flower, look at the leaves, the upper surface, the lower surface of the leaf. There might be insects underneath. Um, usually if you just walk by, you might not see spider mites starting on the lower part of the plant underneath. So you really wanna make sure you look at the entire plant. Look at the stem, there might be boring insects that are getting into the stem. If the plant isn't looking the healthiest, you might even wanna look down into the roots. Um, so that's a really quick way to scout, but go out there frequently and look at the entire plant. 
All right, so what should you be looking for? Oftentimes, uh, you will see the insects more frequently than the damage. So I'm gonna walk through some of the ones that we're seeing frequently that we've highlighted on our sheet here. One that came up really frequently this season with the hot, dry weather is four-lined plant bug. So that is a characteristic yellow, green, and black striped insect that causes piercing, thank you Chris, uh, that causes piercing, sucking damage on the leaves. And so Marion's walking around with an example of that really characteristic feeding damage that's associated with this pest. Fortunately, populations of this pest tend to decline really dramatically around June. So we're most concerned about this pest during hot, dry seasons, and especially early in the season during plant establishment. The next pest on our list is relatively widespread, very broad host range, the tarnished plant bug. So another true bug pest. It's feeding on developing plant tissues, particularly on the developing leaves and the developing flower tissue. So I've seen a lot more of this also with the dry weather this year. It causes a sort of Swiss cheese type feeding on the leaves and Marion actually has some real plant samples that she's gonna pass around of what this damage looks like. So because the damage is happening as those leaves are developing and expanding, you won't see the plant bug feeding on the leaves itself. You'll see the evidence of that damage showing up after those leaves have fully expanded. This is also a pest that is going to be feeding on developing flower tissue and potentially maybe also causing some impacts in grain production systems so because it loves to feed on developing seeds. So those of you who are producers of veg and fruit crops will be familiar with this pest. Managing some of the weedy alternative hosts is a great strategy for dealing with this pest. The next one up is one that almost everyone will have seen independent of the systems unless you are fully in a controlled environment system and that's Japanese beetles. They are large beetles that have an aggregating feeding behavior. The adults are feeding on the leaves. They'll often also be up in the flowers. So we get a lot of reports from growers who are seeing these beetles, but fortunately we do not tend to see high levels of damage, perhaps with the exception of some of our grain cultivars that have very low levels of cannabinoid expression, which speaks to the potential for cannabinoids and glandular trichomes to be having some action against herbivorous pests. George Stack, who's a PhD student working with Larry Smart, has some experiments going on looking at the relationships between pest damage levels and cannabinoid expression in hemp. And so I encourage you all to look out for his results that will be coming out soon. But overall, we're seeing you know relatively low concern in terms of Japanese beetles, even though they are a relatively apparent pest that tends to aggregate. A lot. So our last pest that I'm going to share with you before I pass it over to Marion Zuppel. So she's showing you right now some examples of Japanese beetles and the feeding damage that they cause on leaves um, is the flea beetles. Flea beetles are another pest that we tend to see much more commonly in hot, dry weather when their alternative weedy hosts are less preferred or less available in the environment. They tend to cause sort of a shotgun style irregular feeding damage on leaves. We're mostly seeing red-headed flea beetles showing up in our hemp fields. And again, these are a relatively low concern pest with the exception of early stand establishment where heavy levels of feeding could potentially cause issues. So all of the four pests that I shared with you just now are ones that you should be most concerned about in outdoor cultivation systems. I'm gonna pass it over to Marion She's gonna talk about a few more pests that you'll find in outdoor production systems and then also highlight a few that you would see in more protected culture. All right, Heather's still going around with the red-headed flea beetle. I'm sorry, I should have made a lot more samples. It's a larger crowd than we anticipated, which is good. Um, but so red-headed flea beetle adults and damage, just notice the difference between the size of the damage, the Japanese beetle, much larger holes. Um, the red-headed flea beetle also making holes in the tarnished plant bug, cleaner holes with more of a lighter um, <laughs> surround, the area surrounding the hole is a little paler in color. All right, I'm gonna talk about the 
potato leaf hopper and when Heather gets back, she can pass around the picture. I think hopefully people are familiar with the um, potato leaf hopper, kind of a wedge shaped lime green, both the nymph as well as the adult, they'll both be a pest in hemp. Um, usually in fields that are close to alfalfa, they're coming in from the alfalfa, they'll cause what's termed hopper burn, which on the image you'll see um, the tips of the leaf are starting to turn yellow. Eventually they will wilt and turn brown if you have a very severe leaf hopper population. Um, some of the control measures is trying not to plant your hemp near a potential another crop like alfalfa that could serve as a host where, where they're coming in from. If red clover is a host as well. So the next one is two-spotted spider mite, which um, Heather's passing around. This is the one that we often see on the underside of leaves near the bottom of the plant. Um, it's a mite, so it'll have eight legs and two spotted because it has those two big black spots on either side. Not all of them will have that. If they've just molted, they're probably not going to look like that. They'll be very translucent. But the majority of the ones you see are going to look like that. And the damage is very similar to Thrips damage. She does have a um, picture on there for damage, but we also have Thrips damaged leaves. They're extremely similar. I have not seen any this year in hemp, which kind of surprises me because it's been such a hot, dry year, which usually promotes the two-spotted spider mite. Um, they'll also cause webbing on the plant. If you get a severe enough population, you'll find like little silk webbing and they'll kind of tie some of the leaves together. So, and Judson's gonna talk about biocontrol of two-spotted spider mite in the session later this afternoon. I was just told we're getting tight on time. So this is the cannabis aphid. Uh, fairly distinct, when, if you know aphids, they have like these, um, this aphid has two dark lines running the length of the body. So if you have cannabis aphid, that's the primary aphid that's gonna get into your hemp. Uh, fairly easy to recognize. And since we're tight on time, I'm gonna quickly get into the, um, oh, I, I think I skipped corn borer, I'm sorry. I'm, corn earworm, that was the one that I skipped. Corn earworm, as the name implies, is a pest of corn. So if you're planting close to corn, you might get corn earworm into your hemp as well. They lay their eggs in the flower buds or on the leaves, but then the larvae will hatch and make their way into the flower bud. So you'll have damage in the flower bud if we have. So Heather's passing out the larvae of the corn earworm so you can see what the larvae look like. One thing, we don't have any thresholds for corn earworm in hemp, but you can put traps out, which we use in sweet corn to monitor the population. Um, so you'd put a trap out near your hemp field and see if you have any corn earworm present. If you do, you might want to start checking your flower buds, see if there's any larvae getting in there. And if you want to see adult corn earworm, when Heather gets back, she can pass out the adult corn earworm so you know what you're looking for in those traps. And the final ones that I'm going to quickly go over are the boring insects. We have both the European corn borer as well as the common stock borer. They lay their eggs on the hemp, but then they bore right into it, so you're not going to see a lot of damage outside. What you're going to find is an entrance hole, but usually what you're going to find is just a broken tip or stalk of the hemp plant. And when you peel it back, you're going to find the larvae. Probably more of a problem in some of the fiber hemp rather than the cannabinoid hemp, just because they have a thinner stalk and they're more likely going to snap, whereas the, the real thick CBD hemp can withstand some of that boring pressure. It actually sometimes causes it to branch out more. So some people actually don't mind having a borer in their CBD hemp. Um, did you pass out the, should we just wrap up? Yeah. Um, I will encourage everyone after you get a chance to come through and um, scout through the plants or chat with us to please come up and check out any of these samples of different pest damage that we have. We also do want to highlight that particularly in outdoor cultivation, you will see a really high abundance of beneficials, which we've highlighted a few of, lace wings, as well as um, lady beetles. We do not recommend that you purchase and apply those in outdoor environments. Judd will surely talk about biocontrol solutions in his talk this afternoon that would be more appropriate for indoor cultivation, but there's many beneficials out there, including in grain and fiber cultivation, a really high abundance of pollinators that are utilizing all of the pollen that is produced by male hemp plants. So also 
supporting a beneficial insect population that we want to be aware of when we're thinking about management strategies or broadly about biodiversity <laughs> management on our farms. So I think we will leave it for there and we'll pass over to Judson Reed, who is coming to us from Harvest New York, and we'll talk about soil management. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.